it gives me great pleasure um, to introduce a very dear friend of us in Michigan, all across the state, uh, with big Michigan ties and a stalwart and a, a pioneer in the field of structural heart, um, our friend and colleague, Adam Greenbaum. Um, he is well known to us, so I'm not going to belabor this too long when it comes to um, introduction, um, but I think it is critically important that we acknowledge the great work that he's done in this field and, and how he's made the, you know, I've seen on your website, you treat the impossible cases. Uh, you're like the patron saint of hopeless cases, but you actually get good results and save these people. You and your team, um, the great the Green Berets of Structural Heart, I call you, have led to the pioneering of great work like Transcaville, um, TM, uh, Transcaville, Lampoon, Basilica, uh, Sesame. Um, Adam is well known, so I, I don't want to belabor this too much and um, eagerly would like to introduce him to speak to us. Adam, all yours. Great. I hope that everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, so I hope you guys are ready to get into the weeds um, and how to do these procedures. Um, go to the next slide. You'll see my disclosures. I, I do think there are issues with these procedures that that still need to be solved, particularly when you're using the sapien valve off-label, as, as we're going to get into. But there are some things that you can do in the meantime that might improve some of those outcomes that you saw. So. So I was asked to show talk about both. So so from a valve and valve standpoint, again, I'm not going to read everything on these slides, but certainly pretty much a straightforward procedure with good success. You're going to see that the data that you showed, um, and again, more of yours were valve and valves and valve and rings, is pretty similar. I mean, the one-year survival here usually reported at about 17%. Um, and, and probably better than we do surgical approaches uh, with the caveat that the gradients are a little higher um, at one year, but but overall a pretty good procedure. When you go to valve and ring, the next slide, you're going to see not quite the same. You still have. Just go ahead, next slide, Stan. You're still going to see. Um, outcomes. Um, you're having a little trouble, Stan. Go see if you can click one forward. There you go, perfect. Um, so, so if you if you look at valve and ring as an as a different issue, these valves, they, these rings do fail, uh, and there is some data that suggests that doing it via transcatheter approach is equivalent to surgery, but the outcomes are not nearly as good. So, so how, what can we do to sort of improve the outcome? So for the basics of valve and valve, it starts with valve identification. Just to need to know the inner diameter of the valve, the leaflet heights maybe. I still get, think you should get a CT on all these people. I know you can say, well, you can use fluoroscopy and you know the valve size, but I think you still should look for uh, the post well aligned or is one right in the LDOT. There's a small risk of LDOT obstruction, I think for an elective case, you should still look at it. It can help you with some deployment angles, and, and it could look into tell you if there's maybe some dehiscence. Next slide. <clears throat> For valve and ring, again, even more important to get CT. Stand your forward one. Um, I think there may be, is, I don't know, is there a delay on my part? Just, just if, I, if there's a delay on my screen, I apologize. But so for valve and ring, more important to get the CT because there's a higher incidence of LVOT instruction, either from the angle of the ring or from a long leaflet. There's a higher incidence of the hissence that you should look at. Um, and it can also tell you deployment angles, and we'll get into the summary angle in a little bit more detail. Um, so I think you should get a CT on all your potential valve and rings. Next slide. The procedure itself, relatively straightforward. It's a transeptal approach now, almost always. I like to be a little bit lower than people think, mainly three to four, but I really don't like to be over three, five, to be honest with you. Go forward. 
it's a septostomy with a 12 or 14 balloon for me, depending on what size valve I'm putting in for a 29, I'm putting in, I usually do a 14 septostomy balloon. And then for deployment in general, it's sort of an 80, 20 to 90, 10 deployment in the valve or in the ring, depending on if I'm a little worried about gradients, I'm a little bit worried about LVFT obstruction. I think you can make a decision to post dilate and fracture after the valve goes in in these cases. And I think there's some guidelines here. I'd think about it if your valve was less than 25 or if the index valve area was less than 1.2. I'll keep going on the, on, on the slides here, Stan. And then I did hear you talk. So here you'll see the valve going up at about 80 20. You know, that's a mosaic valve. Probably about 80 20 for most cases. Go forward one. I'll show you here what it looks like if you want a fracture in a smaller valve here at a high pressure balloon. I do all my fractures post in a valve and valve situation. And then go to the next slide. And then we could talk about septostomy later if you want. But I close all my septostomies if I use a 12 or a 14 millimeter balloon to make the hole. Next slide. So that's the basics of the procedure. But here are the pitfalls. There's some issues with delivery, some issues with alignment, leak, LVOT obstruction, and then predicting commissure alignment of your new valve. Next slide. So let's talk quickly about valve delivery. Valve delivery is mainly determined by the location of your septostomy. Valve delivery can be more difficult if you get too high. And it can be more difficult if you're too low. The orientation is determined not by the septostomy a little bit, like in general, be as posterior as we can, but more by the wire in the apex. Go to the next slide. So for valve delivery, I tend to try and get about three. I try and get posterior. Now the orientation of the valve, once you deliver it, is mainly determined by the wire in the apex because the wire will overdrive the valve. And so everyone refers to this aortomitral angle for risk of LVOT obstruction. But what I'm referring to here is the mitral LV apical angle. If the annular plane is nice and perpendicular to the LV apex, your valve is going to deliver nice and straight, as you can see in the picture to the right. But when that angle gets off, for instance, in the AP diameter, click forward stand, you will see that you can get canting even in a valve and valve. If you don't see a perpendicular valve, just like in a taver, in general, the anterior portion and the medial portion will be too low, and the posterior and the lateral portion will be too low. The forward one, same thing in a valve and ring. If you look here, if you don't see if you have parallax in your valve, when you see that parallax, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at low anterior, low medial, high lateral, high posterior. That's what an REO and a non view would look like. And remember, in the ring, you have nothing to help align that when you deploy it. Next slide. So how do you know if you're going to be canted and you're not going to come in straight. Well, that has to do with this emery angle, which is we did, if you look at the valve in, in a sort of three mensio program, there will be a white line that will be perpendicular that will be uh, essentially perpendicular to the mitral annular plane. And then you can draw your line at the LV apex and you will be able to see the difference between the two. So click forward and you will see that in this example, for instance, in the septolateral dimension, everything's perfect. But in the AP dimension, that mitral valve is canted way towards the LVOT. So you can predict that in the AP dimension, when that valve comes in, 
it's going to be dented or you're going to see parallax. Next slide. So if you look at that exact case and then we deliver that valve, you can see how canted it wound up. Now you may say, not that big a deal, valve and valve situation because the posts will help align it. It just makes it a little harder to determine your starting point. So in these cases, what I try and do is put the most ventricular portion of the valve sort of at the end of the post. And then as I go up, slowly let the posts of the valve orient the transcatheter valve and then maybe do a little push at the end. So if you move forward, you'll now see the deployment of the valve in this situation. So let's go next slide. So I have the lateral side up against the posts. We start to deploy and it would wind up deep on the medial side. So I push here for final deployment. And I allow the posts of the magna to align valve. And if you press forward, you'll see the final position on the right. So a well-aligned valve at 80-20. But keep in mind, not all valves have the same strength posts. The magnas, the CEs, the perimounts do a very good job at aligning you. Go to the next slide. But the mosaics and the epics, not quite as much. The second is depth. In general, I try and place the ventricular edge of the valve at the ventricular edge of the posts. I might cheat a little deep if I'm worried about gradients in a little bit smaller valve. I might cheat a little atrial uh, if I'm worried about LVOT obstruction. I understand that the valve that gets pushed past the end of the transcatheter valve, I'm sorry, at the end of the surgical valve does open and close. And so it shouldn't add to LVOT obstruction except if the commissure of your transcatheter valve is in the LVOT. So if I'm really dealing with a borderline LVOT, I'll try and make sure I don't peek out, peek out the ventricular end. So here you can see in a, in a case where we're not going to ventricular. So go to that, go to head to that phone. So here's a mosaic though. I want to show you the mosaics and the epics do not self-align as well. So here was a patient with a very high Emery angle. We tried to deploy with that lateral edge at the dot, which is the most ventricular, but look how it does not fix itself. And so the medial side winds up way ventricular. And in fact, we missed the sewing ring completely on this valve, why it has that crushed appearance on its apical side. So if you go to the next slide and you look at this in 3D, we have completely missed. We're too ventricular. If you look at the anterior portion of the sewing ring, there is no transcatheter valve in the atrium. And you may say, well, it doesn't matter in a valve and valve. It's going to seal on the leaflets alone. But if you wanted to, we had intended to fracture this one. I don't think you can fracture this now because you actually have no transcatheter valve at the sewing ring. So it does matter sometimes in a valve and valve situation. Go on to the next slide. Now, in a ring, you can almost guarantee it will never self-align. So if you look here with a high anterior posterior canting, that pass on the atrial portion of the valve. And then if you click forward, you will see after deployment. On the right-hand side, you'll see that valve is much closer to the ring. The posterior portion is much higher. So we are two atrial portion and we're ventricular on the anterior portion. Go to the next slide. So the valve is going to shorten from the atrial side. And if you're trying to place a canted valve, it's sort of like golfing and trying to place your slice. If you're if you're if the anterior portion is going to be low and you miss the anterior portion, your valve is going to embolize ventricular, as you see on the left. And if you're worried about missing on the ventricular 
you know, being proven tricky on the anterior side and you deploy high, so you get the anterior portion where you want it, but now your posterior portion is way too atrial and you've missed skirt and now you have bad DVL. So if you click forward, you'll see the right deployment gets way too atrial. And if you look at about one o'clock, that's the lateral portion of the ring in an REO, we have totally missed the skirt and you can see bad lateral leak. So the numbers, the numbers, if you go forward to the next graph, basically explain what your effective skirt height is, the more angled you come in. So if you think about the external skirt of a sapien valve, and you have eight millimeters to play with, if you're perfectly aligned with the ring, meaning you're perpendicular, you, know, you have eight millimeters of slop. But as the valve is more canted, your effective skirt length goes down. So if you look, by the time you're 10 degrees off or 15 degrees off, you're talking about an effective skirt length of only two millimeters, meaning you can't possibly place that valve. So the goal here is to try and get the valve as perpendicular to the ring before deployment to basically make your life easier. Go to the next slide. What do you do to improve alignment? So obviously, in these bad situations, you can either not do the procedure, or these are the most, the two most common. If you have a middle high lateral and deeper, and then it'll push back on the wire, bring it. And sort of slap the valve up against the lateral wall, try and correct a septal lateral canting problem. Have a canting problem in the eighth inch. And with the cytostomy, or you do this maneuver where you deflect the delivery system posterior and left atrium. I'm going to go through um, both of these in a second. And of course, choose the valve with the biggest skirt, the tallest skirt. So, for instance, use the Ultra for any of the smaller ones. And, of course, the 20 does now have a little tunnel skirt. So those are our favorites um, for, for these procedures. Go to the next slide. So here's an example of the push-push technique. They push on the delivery catheter, slap the valve up against the lateral wall, but just so you know, that won't correct an AP thing. Angle always is correct as a septal lateral okay, problem. Go to the next line. Dan, can you go forward one? Or are we delayed here? So the only time I would not do a push push is if you have a very thin apex because the wire can get sent out leading to a pseudoaneurysm. See in a diastolic phase, an LV apex less than five millimeters, and I will not do the push push, and I'll look for other ways to correct that angle. Go to the next slide. So, what do we do for an AP canting problem? So, here's where I take and I don't withdraw it all the way to the right atrium. I make sure I am still in the left atrium. I leave about three bend on the delivery catheter and then I rotate clockwise, which will push the atrial portion of the valve posteriorly and sort of seesaw or rock the valve more vertical. And so that's what you can see in that LVOT view on the right, that the valve is now stood up, the correct AP canting problem. If you go to the next slide, you will see it in action. Go ahead, one more slide forward if you can. So in the audio, we are pointed, there's a big canting problem. We're rotating clockwise, so in the REO, 
your delivery catheter, the commander will now look into the page and then press forward. You'll see now that we have corrected the canting in the AP dimension a little. Slide forward and you'll see that the parallax is a little better. It won't complete a little better. Go ahead to the next slide. We'll post So those are, those are the most common ways to fix alignment. Let's talk a minute now about LDOT obstruction. Certainly very low with valve and valve, but not zero. A little bit higher with valve and ring, particularly due to long floppy leaf Flits and of course the highest with Bell and Mac. And, and suffice it to say that this is catastrophic when it happens. It, if it's happened to anybody, um, you, know, you know it is, and we don't have to belabor at this point. So prevention is the really the only way to take care of this. Next slide. The mechanisms of LVOT obstruction are summarized here, and the generally quoted cutoffs are quoted here. But for the most part, these small hypertrophy ventricles with a neo OVOT less than 200 or less than 180, an acute aorta mitral angle less than 120. For the rings, if there's a long or redundant anterior leaflet over 25 millimeters, those are all considered high risk for LVOT obstruction. And then, of course, the valve itself has a skirt. There's not enough room for the skirt you can obstruct. And then, of course, if you have problems with alignment, the anterior portion of the valve winds up to ventricular, then the skirt is farther down in the ventricle and can lead to obstruction. Because everybody's neo-LVOT and skirt neo-LVOT assessments are always assuming that they land the valve perfectly perpendicular. Next slide. So how do we deal with LVOT obstruction? There are two ways to do it. You either modify the leaflet or you modify the septum. The two most common that are talked about are alcohol, septal ablation, and of course, lampoon, which Stan mentioned earlier. Next slide. You know, we developed this family of lampoon procedures to try and handle different anatomic situations. But for this talk, for valve and valve and valve and ring, if you go to the next slide, a simple way to do it would be reverse or tip the base lampoon where you do not have to traverse the base of the leaflet. You can go through the middle of the valve. You can float out the LVOT into the aorta. You can snare that wire. You make your flying V. You put it on the leaflet and then you electrify and pull straight back from the tip to the base, which you can do in a valve and a valve situation and a valve and ring situation because you have a backstop. Go to the next slide. If there's an LVOT post, meaning the valve was not sewn incorrectly and the post is directly in the LVOT, you can just do it twice. You can go to the lateral leaflet and just cut to that side of the post. You can go to the medial side, you can cut to that side of the post and basically free up two of the leaflets and then deploy your valve. Next slide. The only time not to do it during a valve and ring is if you don't have a safe aorta mitral curtain distance. If you look at that picture on the bottom right, some of these rings are sewn very atrial. And the concern there would be that as you pull back on that electrified wire that you might injure the base of the aortic leaflet and cause AI. But if you have a safe aorta mitral curtain distance and a full ring, then you can simply do reverse lampoon in a ring as well. So I wouldn't do it for a band and I wouldn't do it for a full ring if there's no aorta mitral curtain. But otherwise, I think it's pretty safe to do reverse lampoon in all your ring. Next slide. If for some reason you didn't do it and you had a long leaflet and you now had dynamic LVOT obstruction, you can do rescue lampoon. You can just go 
through, make the flying V, and cut the tip of the leaflet just to the edge of the cage to reduce the obstruction. You don't want to bend the cage. You don't need to pull that hard and that far. You just want to cut the tip of the leaflet that extends past the cage. Next slide. Here you can see a case where this happened and an immediate reduction in the gradient. Next slide. The last thing I want to talk about is all of this work to make room can be ruined in a tight situation if your transcatheter valve winds up with a commissure right in the LVOT. We have got pretty good success if we mount one commissure or one pledget of the Sapien valve at 12 o'clock when we crimp the balloon down with the Edwards logo up. When you then flip the Edwards logo down, you deliver that valve, you will almost always have one commissure posterior and then the two other commissures spanning the LVOT. So a little trick, if you don't plan on doing a lot of manipulation of the Edwards valve, the canting angles all look good. You think the Edwards logo is going to stay upside down. You don't think you're going to need to do that maneuver where you go to 30 degrees and then and then clockwise rotate posteriorly. You should be able to do this to help align your comic. Next slide. So this is our algorithm for when we do what we do. We have liberalized. I showed you the cutoffs, but remember, those were minimum cutoffs. I think you need more room in the LVOT to augment flow in order to feel better and to have better exercise capacity. So we have liberalized these criteria to about 250. If you have 250 both skirt and both neo LVOT, just go ahead and do what you want. But if you're if your neo LVOT starts to get under 250, we start thinking about leaflet modification. If the skirt neo LVOT is under 250, then we think about sepal reduction, and then we re-CT, and then we go ahead and do what we need to do after that. If you make enough room with sepal reduction, if both your skirt and your neo LVOT look great now, then just go ahead and deploy your valve or do lampoon in a staged manner. Next slide. Some people, like our friend Jamie McCabe, he's a belt and suspenders kind of guy. He just says, why not do septal reduction and lampoon and everybody just trying to make the most amount of room that he can in the LVOT. Next slide. So I apologize for some of the lag we've had here and the delays getting the slides up. But in summary, I would say that both of these procedures are reasonably straightforward and the intermediate outcomes are okay, um, but there is risk of LVOT obstruction. There are problems with, with planting and alignment and valve delivery. They can be over, they can be predicted very well with a CT and they can be overcome a little with some of these maneuvers, but there's still a lot that we need to improve with this procedure to really get those outcomes as good as what you see fits here.